everyone, thanks for joining. Um, this is the fourth uh, in a series of webinars by Caloris. We're really excited by the engagement we have. We love that you're, you're interested in the things. We hope you gave your opinion in the poll because um, we want to keep these up. Um, in the past, we've had some uh, more broad topics. Um, last week was spray dryer troubleshooting. Um, and this week, we're going to go a little bit more focused. So this is a, um, a tighter topic really focused on high speed, high speed turbo compressors on MVR evaporators and more modern turbo fans and some of the issues in performance or reliability we've seen on the compressors and what the, uh, what the fans might solve. So, and again, ask your questions throughout, please put them into the Q and A and we'll try to answer them either as we go um, or, uh, or at the end. There we are. Um, a quick commercial um, will be very brief uh, for anyone who doesn't know Caloris. Um, our business is the supply of new equipment and upgrades for evaporators, spray dryers, and membrane filtration for the food, dairy, and beverage industries. Um, so enough about who we are. Um, like Missy said, you'll get a link of the recording. Please feel free to use it. If you, um, if you see some value in what we're saying here today, it's useful to you or your company for training purposes or just to banter around ideas please consider this our verbal permission um, for you to, to use this. The link to this, what's re the recording, is going to be on the Caloris website. A um, little bit of terminology about what we're going to go over today. So, you know, if, you, if these are familiar to you, that's great. Um, if not, you'll end the day knowing a little bit more about them. Uh, we're going to talk about falling film evaporators. There are many kinds of evaporators. We'll go over those, but we're going to focus on falling film. Um, we're going to focus on mechanical vapor recompression, and so shorthand MVR, and the way to achieve that uh, mechanical vapor re recompression, generally through uh, turbo compressors or turbo fans. I do want to um, say a minute for safety here uh, about turbo compressors. Um, you know, not every plant has them. Many plants do. They were very popular in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, as the means to provide vapor recompression for these MVR evaporators. Um, in, in the last year, we've saw, seen a couple, so two, catastrophic failures of these machines, like are pictured on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, nobody injured, uh, but long periods of downtime. And, and what, we, one, what one might say is unnecessary downtime. Um, these are high-speed pieces of rotating equipment. If you have them, you'll know that well. Uh, please, um, during this time when uh, a lot of us are not in the plants, we're not in there to help. You as, as engineers or leaders may not be in the plant every day. Um, keep that encouragement up to follow the vendor maintenance programs, do the inspections, get the, um, the service companies to do, come in and do their inspections if they can, uh, replace the recommended parts. Uh, we, don't, we hate going out and seeing a plant that's down and then not having a good solution to help them get back up and running. So, uh, be safe out there, be vigilant, and um, we'll be out there with you soon again. Um, a little, little disclaimer for us, um, we, Caloris does not design or build the turbo compressors we're going to talk about today or the turbo fans we we're going to talk about. Um, we integrate them into evaporators, we know the evaporator process, so we don't have skin in the game on selling you a, uh, necessarily a particular brand of anything, we work with all manufacturures. So. Just a little bit of, of, uh, of that to, um, to make sure there's clarity on the uh, information and advice we're giving. Uh, so evaporators. Um, this is a picture of a very simpler, simple evaporator. If, you've, if you put something on the stove and uh, under atmospheric pressure conditions and put heat to it to try to create boiling and thereby thicken something up, perhaps like a sauce or something like that, you've operated an evaporator um, in the very most simple way possible. Um, we're gonna spend a little more time today talking about falling film evaporators. Um, these industrial evaporators for the dairy industry, juice industry, food industry in general, operate under vacuum, so we get a lower boiling point, but um, the, 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 um, the product falls down these tubes as you see them there, if you're not familiar with it completely. Um, it cascades down the walls of the tube. It doesn't fill them entirely. So the, the tubes are 20 to 50 feet long and you get a thin film, a thin falling film of product on the inside of the tubes and there's heat 
on the outside of the tubes. It all under, operates under vacuum, so you try to boil off the product. Um, oh, I want to make sure I include my, my colleague here. Um, Bruce, am I missing anything on these, uh, on these early slides? No, it's uh, as simple as putting heat on, you know, to the uh, one side of the tube, similar to putting heat on the bottom of the pan. And on the inside of the tube, you start uh, evaporating away water and concentrating what's left, the solid content. That comes out the bottom. Fantastic. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so you go back through history. Um, evaporators would have multiple calandrias. We're showing one, two, three calandrias here. Uh, the, the vapor that's evaporated off the product on the one calandria is used on the heating side of the second calandria um, at a little bit lower boiling temperature. The vapor off the second calandria is used on the heating side of the third calandria. And the vapor that comes off of there might have been waste in a direct steam heated evaporator as they were originally built. Um, what was realized is you can take that heat use electrical energy of a motor, use a, a fan type device um, to compress those vapors and push them back into the front side. So what we're showing here is a multiple effect, so a three effect evaporator with a compression device. So in this case, a mechanical uh, blower, uh, so an MVR to recompress those vapors. That's how the, the first application of MVR went. Um, as those developed and um, got, um, people got more experience with them, it was found that it could be done in one calandria. There might be multiple passes, so the product might come down one set of tubes, be recirculated up to a, a different set of tubes, getting further concentrated, going down a last smaller group of tubes, but the product still coming down the inside of the tubes, and whatever's being boiled off now at one consistent temperature, is being recompressed by the MVR and pushed back into the heating side. So we're using electrical energy of the motor to take the vapors that still have a lot of energy, a lot of heat in them, recompress them and push them into the heating side to, um, to keep this machine running without using new fresh steam all the time. Bruce, is that a fair explanation? That is a fair description, and it, the you know the the, the history of going from steam heated evaporators uh, then to compressors at first because they were you were trying to duplicate the uh, compression across multiple effects the way we previously did with steam using a mechanical device, and that required a compressor, and we'll get into that in the next slide as to why the compressor uh, worked there, uh, but turbofans offered a number of advantages. And as the industry moved into using turbofans, uh, initially less compression ratio, they only effectively worked across one effect like this. All right, thanks, Bruce. All right, so a couple of pictures of the machines we're talking about. So now we've gotten through the idea that both of these machines can be applied for mechanical vapor recompression. The picture on the left is um, you can still buy a turbo compressor today. I just happen to have a picture of a bit of an older one. So this is a legacy turbo compressor. You can buy new ones today. We'll explain a little bit what they are in the next slide. And this is a more modern turbo fan um, and um, applied to these, um, to these evaporators. So a little bit of a difference between the two. So a modern turbo compressor or a, a turbo compressor in general, you take in your, um, your steam vapors, um, and they're, they're compressed, they're heated up. Through that compression, um, again, going back to, to chemistry, when you, when you compress something, you raise its temperature. Um, through that compression, you raise its temperature by about 25 degrees. That's what was needed in those evaporators, and a turbo compressor, starting back in the 70s, was the machine that could do it. Um, it runs at a pretty high RPM, so greater than 12,000 RPMs. It runs through a gearbox, so that adds some complexity. Um, was always a bit maintenance intensive. Um, could be sort of intolerant of, of uh, process upset. You'd say it was a more delicate um, process operation when, a, when a, a turbo compressor was involved. 
it's a to close tolerance machine. It's not a fan in a housing. It's much more closely tolerance than that to get these types of compression ratios that can get you a 25 degree temperature rise. So it's close tolerance. That means expensive parts, potentially cast in, in pellers and lots of machining involved, especially if there's, um, you know, you're taking it apart for maintenance. And it's rather intolerant of liquid droplets in the vapors, acids in the vapors and things like that. So once you have one, um, replacement is expensive and lead times are long, whether it's for parts or replacement. But it was the best thing that was available when, uh, when these MVRs were first developed. It was the right thing um, before new technology was, was involved. Uh, so the contrast to that is the turbofan. So turbofans came along after the turbo compressors. Um, an older turbofan, um, again, now we're talking 20 years old, um, could achieve a compression ratio of 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, a more modern machine could, can re raise temperatures due to the compression to about 15 degrees temperature rise. And what's the difference? What, what's the difference in a modern versus an older? Uh, much improved understanding of material science. Uh, so we can run the tip speeds of these turbofans faster to achieve the compression. Um, and the computer modeling, um, you know, how to design the fan blades um, to get the most compression out of it. So the CFD type modeling that we can do today has led the turbofan manufacturers to really improve their performance. So that's the difference between the older and more modern ones. So how do these turbofans run? Uh, Okay, they're about 3,000 to 5,000 RPM, so a little bit lower speed, um, direct drive, so we get the gearbox out of there, makes them a whole lot simpler. Um, they're much more tolerant of, of, of upset conditions, so vapor flow upsets, changes, we find them more robust. Um, we do a little bit of water spray into the turbo fan, keeps the wheel clean. Um, if we've got superheated vapors, it gets them de-superheated. Um, it's now welded construction, doesn't have to be machined construction, so a lot simpler device lower cost device, lower replacement cost, lower repair cost, and much faster lead time. So really, turbofans have become the go-to. It's become the typical industry solution over the last 20 years. There's turbo compressors out there. You can get a replacement for them. But a new evaporator today, where MVR is, is the solution, um, based on energy costs, things like that, would be provided with a turbofan. So, um, Bruce, am I missing anything? Is there anything to note on, on the two machines themselves? Sure, and you know, just, there are, uh, just a few additional comments here. Uh, first of all, it, because of, you know, the compressor achieves its high compression ratio because of that tight tolerance of the impeller wheel to its housing. Um, and because of that tight tolerance, if there are entrained liquid droplets on that suction into the wheel, it's very intolerant of that. It actually causes erosion of both the wheel and the housing uh, and damage to both over time. Uh, versus on the turbofan, as it's noted, uh, Jim noted, uh, we routinely spray water into the suction of one of those, of a fan, because lower compression ratio, there's a more generous um, uh, gap between the wheel and the housing, and it can tolerate, and also with the lower speed as well. And the, uh, if anybody out there has uh, operated a compressor in the past, they're notorious, um, and you'll forgive me if we have any uh, compressor uh, vendors out there, but the uh, surging. If, if you starve the suction inlet to a compressor and it's not getting its uh, designed vapor flow into the suction, it will begin to cavitate and, uh, and it will scream. You can audibly hear it and the machines will even shake. And the solution to that is to take some discharge vapor off that compressor and return it to the suction side. Um, and effectively you're losing efficiency there. And, and versus a turbo fan, because of the wider gap between the wheel and the housing, you it can actually slip a little vapor from the discharge side inside the housing back to the suction side. It's self-compensating uh, and turbofans don't have that surging issue. And then the one other comment I'll make is uh, the note here on um, a tolerance for acid vapors. Uh, in the past, compressors were more commonly of, uh, you know, cast 
carbon steel. And when you go into a CIP and you get uh, acid vapors that can carry over from a typical CIP of an evaporator, those would just etch away at that impeller and the housing. And so it was common for uh, compressor evaporators when they went to a cleaning cycle and you're going to do an acid cleaning, you had to actually shut the compressor down and bypass it so that you don't get those acid vapors into the, the housing. Turbofans now are stainless steel housings and, and uh, duplex, super duplex materials. Very forgiving. You just keep running it during the CIP the way you would during operation on product. And, the, and you know, no damage is going to occur from the acids. In fact, you get a little bit of cleaning in case you've had some carryover of uh, minerals during the, uh, the operation cycle. And I'll go back to you, Jim. All right, thanks, Bruce. Um, and again, you know, the, 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 we're going to go into the application of this now. The rhetorical question we're sort of asking is, you know, we've seen these catastrophic failures of turbo compressors recently. We know they're out there on a lot of evaporators. Um, could I replace them? How do I make my operation more reliable? And we believe that since the new evaporators are being supplied with turbo fans, the, the, the answer is, well, one can replace a turbo compressor with a turbo fan. And we're going to walk you through um, how, we, how one arrives at the answer to that question. So uh, again, our picture of a, of a single effect mechanical vapor recompressor evaporator. Um, in this case, we're on a turbo compressor. And we have one turbo compressor. And just I've picked some random temperatures here just to illustrate the point. Um, you can understand this exercise for your actual temperatures and your actual compression ratios, but it's fairly representative. And what we're saying is coming off the, the boiling side here, we're, we're pulling vapors into the turbo fan that are 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're compressing them with the electrical energy of the motor. And they are leaving and getting put back into the heating side of the evaporator at 175. So we're seeing a 25 degree Fahrenheit compression temperature rise um, using this turbo compressor. So that's the situation I have. What if I wanted to replace it? What are my options? I want something simpler, more reliable, doesn't have these operational issues like Bruce described, um, and doesn't have the expensive parts and, and all of the rest. Well, one could look at one turbo fan. And then, like I said earlier, with these older turbo fans, um, again, vapor in, compression using electrical energy, the fans are running a slower speed, so we're not getting in as much compression. We're taking our 150 in, but we're only getting 160 out. So not really a great solution with one turbo fan. It just doesn't meet the process objectives. But it can be done with two. Please forgive my, um, my simple illustration here. Um, but it is meant that you can take one turbo fan, um, take the outlet of one, put it in the inlet of the next, and take the outlet of the second, and use that, what's compressed after the second fan, to be your heating medium. Now, in other industries, these turbo fan manufacturers are used to stringing these fans together in all sorts of um, lengths, four of them, five of them, six of them, to compound the compression ratio in series. In evaporators, um, we're, we're not approaching that. All I'm trying to say is that the fan manufacturers are quite comfortable with this scenario. We're not dragging them into new territory. They are bringing us into um, the grounds that they're already um, very familiar with. So what we're seeing here is two turbo fans. I'm calling it older because they're, they're of the style of, of blade and fan where you can only get that smaller compression ratio. 150 degrees into the first fan, 160 out of the first and into the second, and 170 degrees out. So 10 degree temperature rise across each of two fans. Easy to do, but uh, we still don't think we're achieving the process. We're not getting that full 25 degree temperature rise. Now, maybe your evaporator's been repurposed. Maybe you don't need all of, um, all of the capacity that your particular evaporator has. Well, then maybe two turbo fans are, are, are an option for you, or one is. But um, again, this is the older style, what's not, uh, you know, before the most modern applications of material science and CFD modeling. So here's the ultimate, three fans in a row. Um, so what I'm showing you is, is 
again an MVR, just three turbo fans with that older type of compression ratio. 150 degrees into the first fan, raising it to 160 into the second fan, raising it to 170 into a third fan, and coming out of the third fan at 180 degrees. Well, now we have something. We've at least achieved the process objectives. So we can, we can do it. We can replace a turbo compressor with three fans when it was the older style of fan. But three fans always had a cost hurdle to it. We've got to buy three fans, three speed drives, redo ductwork, have enough space for them. And so really this solution didn't get applied to evaporation because the cost was, um, was always prohibitive, but that's changed. So where we're at today, the most modern application, and, and Caloris has been applying this with the fan manufacturers for several years now, um, is using these new turbo fans with you know, modern materials and CFD designed wheels to get that 15 degree temperature rise, that 15 degree compression um, off of each fan while still being low RPMs, made of stainless steel, so you can hold vacuum and, and run through um, the, the fan and wash the fan while you're doing CIP. All of these benefits are gained. Um, you're coming in at 150 and at 165 up to 180 and you've achieved your process objectives. And now you've begun to cross that cost threshold where this becomes a realistic solution for replacing these problematic and very aging turbo compressors that are out there. So that's the, the sort of development we wanted to, to, to look at and take you through, um, sort of how we've seen the industry develop and where the hurdles have been, and now that the final hurdle has been removed, um, present you with the, the, uh, what we think is the leading solution for, um, for dealing with these aging um, and sometimes failing turbo compressors. Bruce, um, feel free, weigh in on, on what we've said here over the last couple of slides. All right, so uh, I think you've covered it very well. It, it, you know, the, the uh, primary disadvantage uh, that we often see with compressors is, is the maintenance, routine annual maintenance costs, as well as uh, the replacement cost. And you can purchase two turbofans for the price of one compressor if you're buying new. So there you, you gain the advantage of being able to, to uh, effectively CIP under, uh, uh, under vacuum, under operation. You can spray and desuperheat with the uh, spraying water into the suction of both fans. And you know, these two fans can be uh, synchronized with VFDs. So effective control of uh, the speed of two fans versus just having one compressor. When you, you, know, when you have uh, modern VFDs, it very effectively operating. We've done a number of conversions of uh, take, replacing an old compressor with two new turbofans, uh, gaining performance efficiencies. And actually by this example, as you can see, we're actually getting a higher compression combined with these two fans versus the one original uh, compressor. And we have you know, effectively executed that in replacing an old compressor with two fans and achieving higher performance capacities uh, off an old evaporator with the same surface area. Back to you, Jim. All right, thanks, Bruce. Um, so we've just got a couple of more pictures here. Um, if I can still advance my slides. So there we are. Um, the same solution can be applied to the multi-effect evaporators we started with. Remember when we, we said the multi-effect, multi calandria evaporators were the original concept. And you can easily compress across the multiple calandrias, whether it's one fan, one turbo fan, or more. Um, so it's still a possibility, um, as we're showing here. So a du dual turbo fan solution to replace a turbo compressor across multiple calandrias. Um, again, just the pictures. We started with, you know, so turbo fan, again, a picture of the machine now that we've talked about it direct drive, um, stainless steel housing, running about three to 5,000 RPM, turbo compressor, uh, much more tightly toleranced, you can see in a cast housing, complexity with uh, the gearbox, circulated oil, oil coolers, running at 12,000 RPMs, um, much more complex, uh, complex machine. 
I'll, I'll sort of hang here. Um, it's the, the um, an exploded view of what a turbo fan would be um, with inlet guide vanes, the, the housing, the fan wheel, the fan housing, a direct drive setup. Okay, it's, it's bearings and there's circulated oil on the bearings uh, and then into the motor, but still fairly straightforward machine that can be much more easily maintained, um, especially um, remotely. Local, local uh, service technicians can be trained to, to uh, do the basics with this um, so that specialized support's not brought in every time. So, and it just, I'll add a comment there, Jim, that you know, it went in the um, original designs when we were using turbo compressors, the, um, the, the common design was to use, I, I have a configuration with backup steam. So the compressor, the evaporator could continue to operate when the compressor went down because you had a multiple effect design and could effectively utilize steam uh, as your backup source although at a much higher energy cost. It, what we found uh, through time was that the turbofans are very reliable and there really is no need to have a steam backup. You know, these, these turbofans operate for years continuously before you have to do a routine maintenance on the, uh, on the uh, bearing assemblies. So with that previous having steam backup was sort of a requirement when we had compressors, not a concern today with turbofans. All right, thanks Bruce. So um, we, we're on time. Um, I think it might be the first time with our Caloris webinars that we're finishing on time. Thank you everyone for your uh, 30 minutes of attention. I, I, I hope you found it interesting. Um, we do have a white paper that we prepared late last year that is this topic. If you want a little bit more meaty information um, and information you can circulate um, for discussion around your office or your company, uh, Missy's gonna attach the link of this uh, to this white paper on our Caloris website, www.caloris.com. Um, she'll attach the link to it in the email you're gonna get to the recording of this presentation. So you can get right at this uh, white paper if it hits home with you, if these ideas hit home with you. So with that, thanks from Bruce and I and Caloris. Um, you can we do have one question. Yes, we do have one question. Right. Um, looking into the future on turbofans, any new developments on the horizon? Perhaps make them more efficient. And it, uh, you know, I'll take this, Jim. The um, it, that is something that uh, our, the turbofan vendors are always working towards. Uh, and with, uh, you know, uh, dynamic modeling capabilities nowadays, you know, uh, what they can do to modify the, uh, it, the uh, shape of the, uh, the impellers to get, reduce uh, inefficiencies, uh, gain a little more compression, materials of construction, significant leaps were made when we went to the super duplex uh, fans and being able to get that uh, compression up to 15 degrees. You know, it's always a little something that's nibbling away and um, we encourage those turbofan vendors uh, to keep pushing the envelope. We've questioned them on possibly going to titanium wheels. Um, we haven't heard any developments in that yet, uh, but we keep tickling them and uh, hopefully they will. What horsepowers are the turbo turbofans? And that can vary wi widely. Uh, we we have done uh, um, a single effect MBR um, with a uh, 15, 1500 horse motor on the uh, turbofan, evaporating about uh, uh, you know close to 100,000 pounds an hour of water. And uh, for us, that became the limit primarily because of the size of the vapor separator. Uh, there is, you know, there really is, uh, you know, no. Well, there is a physical upper limit, but I'm not quite sure what that, what that would be. And we have one more question. You are spot on in this discussion. Turbofan is the way to go. I would never rebuild my TVR looking back. But we thank you for that, uh, <laughs> Kevin. And then an anonymous, uh, can you speak again on the preventative maintenance requirements of turbofans? Can facilities maintain these themselves or is maintenance usually done by the fan manufacturer? 
And when it comes down to routine annual maintenance, uh, that can be done by, um, you know, a, um, it, by local or even in-house maintenance crews on uh, routine maintenance of the, uh, of the uh, bearing assemblies. Um, about every, about every 10,000 hours, uh, it requires a more comprehensive um, overhaul of the, uh, of the shafts and the bearing assemblies. And we do recommend uh, that you work with the uh, turbofan manufacturers and, and uh, they, there's two primary manufacturers for turbofans uh, represented here in the United States and they both provide uh, support maintenance services, and we do recommend that you work with them for uh, a, you know a routine maintenance contract there. But I think about every five years is really what is required. Yeah, Bruce, if I could if I could add to that, sure. um, and and say yeah, if you've got the people with your local maintenance staff, if you if if your if your local people are have the mill writing skills and are comfortable with the high speed equipment. Um, then I think that the, the simple maintenance of a turbofan, the regular maintenance of a turbofan can be completed locally with, without, uh, without the support. But it should be, you know, it, it does come down to the, 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 the skills of the labor base that you can have at your plant, so. Um, and then we have one more question here. Are there multiple types of seals on turbofans? And if so, which ones are best for preventing banking leaks? And uh, there are, you know, the seals on these because of the uh, vacuum operation inside the, uh, the, the, the fan housing, it's a uh, multiple uh, labyrinth seals are utilized. And we usually, we use either vacuum, uh, we pull a vacuum on the, uh, on the, on the uh, opposite end of the seal housing to maintain the equilibrium or steam. Uh, into the into the atmospheric side of the seal labyrinth housing, um, we are commonly using steam supply on uh, a lot of our turbofans that we supply, but we've also done vacuum. All right, um, Jim, if you wouldn't mind ending your screen share, I'll bring up the announcement for next week again. Um, so for those of you who are interested, Jim will be back next Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern to do a, another webinar on spray dryer CIP. And I'm also going to try and bring the poll back up for anybody who um, didn't get a chance to weigh in earlier on topics that would be of interest to you. Please feel free to weigh in now. Um, we have a selection of potential topics up there. Looks like we had one more question come in. Um, do you have to maintain continuous spray of water? And the simple answer is you do not. It is just a, an advantage uh, for improving uh, long running operation. It, you, with either a compressor or a turbofan, there's always the, the, uh, a little bit of potential carryover coming with the vapor flow and you can end up getting deposits on the wheel of either a compressor or a turbofan. And having that mist of uh, water spraying into the suction of the turbofan can, prevents that from drying on and becoming a, a, you know, a, a long-term imbalance issue as you get a, a potential buildup on the wheel. It just prevents that. And you also get, whenever you compress a vapor, uh, you're superheating that vapor. Uh, and by adding uh, the water spray into there, we can desuperheat so that the discharge vapors at the higher pressure coming off the fan are saturated rather than superheated. And you just get the added benefit of efficient performance in, as those vapors flow into the shell of the calandria. Okay. Um, let's see. As you can see on this little advertisement I have up here, um, you can register for the upcoming webinar next week at the URL on your screen, which will be in that email you'll, you'll receive tomorrow, coloris.com slash coloris dash webinars. That's also where we happen to be archiving all of the recordings from our previous webinars and we maintain the upcoming schedule. So we have webinars scheduled now through the end of May. 
Um, so if you want to be the first to know about our new webinars as they get scheduled, I encourage you to join our email list and you can do that by scrolling to the bottom of any page on our website and entering your email address where prompted. And we promise not to spam you. We are um, sending out one email per week. It's an e-newsletter with industry topics and announcements like upcoming webinars and such. So we hope you'll join us there. Um, if you have any additional questions, say a question that, oh, actually we do have one question that came in in the meantime. Um, CIP time is always in the forefront of everyone's mind. Any new improvements on the mechanical application side? I did a bunch of optimizing over the years. And if you want, Jim, I'll take this one as well. It's <clears throat> the, when you're talking about CIP, that's on the, the product contact portions of the, uh, in our case, we're talking evaporators here. Uh, to sh minimize the time required for CIP turnarounds, the, the keys are to minimize uh, intervention steps required by the operators to change setup configurations, um, it's, you know, change operating conditions, break vacuum. It's the, um, you know, the, the key here to minimizing that is um, good hydraulic flows, get those CIP chemicals in and get them circulating and out effectively and quickly. And uh, while maintaining otherwise the consistent operating conditions vacuum of the, of the evaporator system. Okay, and uh, Bruce Rick says to tell you he misses you. <laughs> um, all right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions you didn't want to ask in the webinar setting, you can always send us email, and the easiest way to do that is to email me at info at .com. That goes directly to me, and then I'll forward your question to whoever is best. And that's also where you can um, suggest additional webinar topics if there's something we haven't covered yet that's not in the poll that's up there today that you'd like to see, please reach out and let us know because we're really enjoying these webinars and we want to keep offering content that is of interest to you. So with that, I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to end today's webinar. Thanks for joining us and we hope that you will join us on a future webinar. Have a good rest of your week, everybody.